Welcome to today's workshop, Demonstrating Inclusivity and Equity in Your Course. As our student population becomes more diverse, so too do our classrooms. Educators are encouraged to promote inclusive equity within the classroom culture to support an increasingly diverse student population. So in this workshop, we'll cover strategies and resources that will help you integrate inclusive and equitable practices and policies into your courses. I'll be your presenter today. My name is Amanda Smothers, and I'm the Teaching and Learning Coordinator in the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning at NIU. I earned my PhD from NIU in 2016. I've been teaching college English for over 14 years and have been a faculty developer at NIU for the past three and a half years. And I'll take questions throughout and at the end of the presentation. So if you have any questions related to what we're discussing, feel free to post that um, question or that comment into the chat thread um, or raise your hand and you know speak out um, using your microphone and I'll address those questions as they come up. So in the, the text chat, just let me know what your department or division is, what's your role, and what you hope to get out of this workshop. All right, so KNPE grad assistant working on the PhD, uh, want to make sure that you're creating a safe and comfortable environment for all of your students. That's excellent. Thank you. Um, so that's definitely something that we will look at today through this workshop. Um, so something that I like to do with my students in my online synchronous classes is just do a little bit of a check in at the beginning of the class period, how they're doing today, have them share an emoji in the chat. Um, so I'll get that started here. Um, I like, um, you know, knowing where everybody's at in their headspace before we get started. And then, you know, I know maybe someone's having a bad day. Maybe they aren't going to be participating as much that day. Um, or someone's, you know, having a great day and maybe they'll be a little bit more energetic. So um, let's see. So I'll share a fun Halloween themed one. Jack Lantern. All right, so by the end of this workshop, participants will be able to explain the importance of diversity, identify the connection between education and equity, overcome resistance to adding diverse content to courses, explain what it means to have a diverse mindset, connect universal design for learning to equity practices, and integrate strategies for inclusivity and equity into courses. So first of all, what's diversity got to do with it? Um, let's talk about what inclusive teaching is. Essentially, inclusive teaching is pedagogy that tries to serve all students' needs and support their learning and engagement. Making diverse perspectives accessible to students enriches student learning. It can elicit stimulating discussions. It can help us position learning within students' own cultural contexts. And a common misconception is that inclusive teaching means bringing up current events or issues of diversity into, for example, like a math or a science class. So you should offer diverse content, texts, and scenarios in those courses where they're relevant and they are relevant. Um, but that's not the only component to inclusive teaching. It also involves focusing on your teaching methods and embracing student diversity in whatever form it takes, including race and gender and ethnicity, socioeconomic background, disability, ideology, personality traits, and then treating those diverse characteristics as assets in your classroom. So related to inclusive teaching um, is another term, which is culturally responsive teaching. And that involves utilizing students' cultural capital in our courses. Strategies for culturally responsive teaching include encouraging students to draw on their prior knowledge and diverse experiences, making learning relevant and drawing connections to students' lives, 
providing opportunities for students to leverage their cultural capital and demonstrate their expertise on those topics. And considering the materials and images that we use in our courses and classrooms and making sure that they represent diversity so that students can see themselves in our fields and most importantly, um, we need to forge connections with students so that they feel respected and valued. So ultimately, um, traditional teaching methods don't necessarily serve all of our students well. Education can be an equalizer, but that's not a given. We need to work hard to make it an equalizer by being inclusive educators and minimizing inequities so that students can succeed. Inclusive teaching can lead to many positive outcomes, including narrowing of achievement, achievement gaps, increasing student engagement, and helping students value our disciplines and our approaches to teaching and learning. So one common objection that I hear to integrating inclusive teaching in our courses um, or culturally responsive teaching in our courses is that we just we just don't have the time to do that. We have too much course content to get through in the semester. We couldn't possibly add one more thing to our plates. We all think that we have too much content to cover and it's daunting to think about making changes, particularly if it, that takes time and effort that we feel like we just don't have. Or maybe we're so stressed or overwhelmed that we just don't have the mental bandwidth to think about how to add inclusivity and equity into our courses in meaningful ways. However, we don't need to completely redesign our courses to make them more equitable. We aren't talking about reinventing the wheel here. We can take baby steps. We can start by considering some adjustments that we can make to our courses that help us attract and retain a diverse population of students to our course, and by extension, our discipline. One small change that we could implement is to make sure that our course reflects the diversity of our society and our student body. So just something as simple as selecting multimedia that represents diversity in all its forms or choosing required readings that reflect diversity in authorship or in the examples that they use could help us to reflect diverse voices and perspectives. We want to pay attention to the authors and the voices that we elevate in our courses and make sure that we're prioritizing diverse viewpoints and experiences. That's something that we can do in any discipline. Another small change might be to use inclusive language in our classes. So acknowledge and respect our students, share our pronouns, give students the option to share theirs, but don't require it. Use students acknowledge identity terminology. That practice will help students feel safer and more accepted in our classes and increase our courses sense of community and connection, which has proven to increase persistence and success rates. An additional way to tweak our courses without overhauling them completely would be to ensure accessibility in our course materials. So if we haven't already, or if you haven't already, I recommend exploring the Blackboard, Blackboard Ally resources on our CITL website so you can explore how to use that tool to make your course materials more accessible to all students. So that tool can help you identify documents that might have accessibility issues. It can assist you in fixing those issues so that all students can benefit from your online course materials. And in addition, the tool provides a valuable service to students. It allows them to access documents that you upload in alternative formats, such as HTML or MP3 audio or Beeline Reader or Braille. Another adjustment you can make is to ensure that your syllabus sets the tone for your course. So reflect diversity and inclusion in the tone of your syllabus. Include inclusive syllabus policies, and point students to supportive resources. Um, you could include diversity statements, and you can find examples of those in NIU's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Educators Toolkit, which I'll show you um, in some more detail later in this presentation. Ultimately, to be successful in integrating inclusivity and equity in our courses, we need to practice developing an inclusive mindset so that we see every pedagogical decision that we make through that lens. For each reading or each teaching decision I make, I need to consider who might be left out if I approach teaching in that way. So are there other more inclusive ways I could be approaching this subject? Students vary in their ability to stay focused and 
to process what we're saying and to identify key ideas in our lessons and to organize the information that we provide to them in our lectures. Some faculty might think that it's hand-holding or coddling students to provide, for example, a skeleton outline of the lecture or PowerPoint notes handouts, but providing that skeleton outline has been proven to help students focus and take more effective class notes. At the very least, all students will have just minimal notes that can identify the main points of the lesson and show how those ideas fit together. They'll also learn what a good structure for note taking is based on your demonstration within that skeletal outline. The students who don't have trouble with note taking might not need that skeletal outline or might not need those PowerPoint notes handouts, but it won't hurt them to receive it. And those students who do have trouble with note taking are going to benefit a lot from that resource. A couple of perspectives often get in the way of students learning. Um, one is having a fixed mindset, which might manifest as a student saying, you know, I'm just, I'm just not a good writer, I'm just not good at math, or I'm just not good at, you know, chemistry. Um, students with a fixed mindset think that if they were going to be good writers or good at math, they would have already naturally developed the quote unquote talent. So to counter that fixed mindset, we want to encourage a growth mindset in our classes. We want to help students recognize that intelligence and learning skills are not fixed or predetermined. They can be developed. Um, talk to students explicitly about growth mindset. Let them in on tasks that you found difficult or that you failed at and tell them how you overcame those difficulties by um, persisting and learning and also encourage students to use growth mindset language. So for example, instead of saying, I'm just not a good writer, have students get in the habit of saying, I haven't developed good writing skills yet, but I will get there. Um, another mindset that gets in the way of students learning is something that you might've heard of before or even experienced yourself, and that's imposter phenomenon. And that is when we feel like a fraud despite our accomplishments. For our students, this might lead them to feeling like they don't really belong in college, even though they were accepted based on certain criteria that they met. And it's a common feeling, particularly among first generation college students like myself. I still feel this way sometimes, and, and maybe you do too. But one way to combat this feeling in students is to encourage them, remind them they do belong here. Um, I include ally statements in my syllabus um, and diversity statements, and I read them aloud on the first day of class. I explain that I want my students to feel comfortable coming to me, that I'm a safe and accepting person, that they belong here, that I was a first college student, that I had struggles as well. Um, so remind your students that they belong throughout the semester. Sometimes we can forget and those creeping feelings of being a fraud can sneak up on us when we least expect them. Um, so for example, if a student earns a poor grade on an assignment or on a test, help them figure out what they can do to improve. Give them the confidence to improve rather than just allowing them to feel like it's proof that they don't belong. And if you're comfortable doing so, share a time when you experienced imposter phenomenon. Share an experience where you also failed at something and what you did to put your, pull yourself back up and work towards your goals. Tell your students that they belong and that they can do well and grow. Another strategy for inclusive pedagogy is universal design for learning or UDL. So consider using UDL principles to make sure that all students are served by the learning experience. You don't have to go all out and redesigning your course, but you could include some basic principles as you work toward making your course more inclusive. And the essential tenets of UDL are to provide multiple means of engagement, so the why of learning, provide multiple means of representation, the what, and provide multiple means of action and expression, the how. UDL has generally been understood as a way to improve the learning environment for students with disabilities, but UDL principles apply generally to just creating a more inclusive classroom setting for all learners. So some ways to incorporate UDL principles in your course to make learning more inclusive um, include some of these things here. So create a course alignment map to make sure that all course materials and instructional materials and learning activities align with your course learning outcomes. 
You can even share that map with students so that they understand why the course is designed the way it is and why you're assigning them the, the, the tasks that you're assigning them. Um, also figure out what your students already know. Use that information to craft a learning experience that fits your students. Use formative and summative assessment. Formative assessments will help you see what students are learning, monitor their progress towards learning outcomes. Um, it also allows you a chance to modify your teaching approaches when you see that students maybe aren't progressing like you expected them to. And then summative assessments help you with accountability and determining whether students have ultimately met those course learning outcomes. Um, also identify and reflect on your teaching practices. For example, you could use a teaching practices inventory to help you identify your teaching habits and goals. Uh, to see whether your teaching philosophy matches your actual teaching style, to determine whether your teaching style is the best approach to supporting student learning or courses. And you could also take a teaching inventory that explicitly addresses the degrees of inclusivity in your syllabus and course design. Don't be afraid to change learning activities and assessments as needed. If students aren't reaching your learning outcomes, use data from assessments and observations to reflect on maybe the causes of why they're not reaching those learning outcomes and create a plan to modify your learning activities and your assessments to better prepare students to meet those outcomes. Ideally, that should be done throughout the course rather than just waiting until the end of the course to assess and make changes for the next semester, because that doesn't do anything to help our current students succeed. So we don't want to just kind of write off our current semester as semester students as sort of a lost call. Can't possibly do anything to make their learning experience better. We want to continually be looking at our practices and, and figuring out what we could do better. Um, an important way to demonstrate inclusivity in our courses is to make personal connections with each of our students. That doesn't mean, mean becoming personal friends or crossing any boundaries of what's acceptable um, but it does mean that students feel seen and that they feel connected to both us as their educators and the class as a whole. So create an inclusive classroom climate by learning about students' backgrounds, uh, collaborate on rules for discussion of controversial issues, or develop deeper racial and socioeconomic awareness for yourself, um, help students develop that awareness as well. One small step that you can take that's that's also meaningful to create connections with students is to share your gender pronouns in your syllabus and in your email signature line. Um, I put mine on my my name tent so that I can you know learn my students' names and they can learn my name at the beginning of the semester. Um, and on Blackboard, and that models inclusion by sending a message to students that you know your class is a safe space for them to learn. Um, also, learn and use students' preferred or proper names. Ask them what they prefer to be called on the first day of class. Make note of that on your class roster. And also show students how to change their preferred um, or proper name in Maya and IU. And let them know that their preferred or proper name is then going to show up on class rosters, on the academic requirements report, on grade rosters, the online directory, O365, and Blackboard. Um, students can have their preferred or proper name also displayed on their one card. And it'll also be listed in the commencement program. Um, so that's one way to you know, show students that you care um, about their safety and their identity is by showing them that they can do that. Um, and also don't require students to share their pronouns. Uh, students might not be ready or feel comfortable to do so but just provide an inclusive environment in which they can feel comfortable that they're included. You can share your pronouns if you want to. You can invite them to share their pronouns, but not require them to do so. Um, making personal connections with students may take some practice or it may come naturally to you. What's tricky is finding the time, using the ad appropriate language, and then establishing those boundaries. So some other tips for creating personal connections are um, on this slide, using students' names. Use, use a student's name when you talk to them. If you're bad with, with names, have students use name tense. I do that. Um, if you have trouble pronouncing names, ask students for a phonetic spelling or a recording so that you can learn how to pronounce their name. Make the effort um, at NIU, 
you know, you can um, and add to Blackboard uh, name pronunciation. Um, so encourage students to use that, use that yourself um, too, so that they know how to pronounce your name and model that for them. Um, you also engage students in small group introductions during the first week or so of class so that they can learn more about each other and start developing that sense of community and belonging. Students are gonna feel more comfortable, hopefully coming to class and engaging if they, they feel like they know their classmates. Uh, also, you can send a short note or an email of kudos to a student who did well on an early assessment or who made an improvement. Um, and also you can reach out individually to students who are struggling or who didn't do so well on an assessment and explain you know, your willingness to help them and provide a time when you can meet with them face-to-face -face or virtually. Um, check in on students who've missed a class. Uh, to make that easier, ask for multiple ways to communicate with students at the beginning of the semester, um, or use Navigate to text your students. Um, try emailing through their, their student email first. If they don't respond, try another mo mode of communication. Um, and just be careful of FERPA regulations when you're using outside communication, though. Uh, make yourself human to them, so humanize. Share who you are. Offer some insight about yourself when it's relevant or to whatever you're discussing in class. Encourage students to do the same. Post maybe an about the instructor bio on Blackboard. That can give some students some idea of your educational and professional background um, and maybe reveal something personal but not too personal. Use some hobbies or something to show them that you're a real person. Also, um, along the same lines as that, you know, something else that's humanizing is to acknowledge when you're struggling. You don't have to overshare, but let students know when you are struggling or experiencing hard times, and that helps them to see it's okay for them to do the same, to share that information with you. Um, students will also struggle. Acknowledge their struggles. It could just be as simple as saying, I know you're having a hard time and I'm keeping you in my thoughts. Um, and then provide support, support for students. This can be through your office hours. I call mine student hours. Um, so they feel more welcome. Supplementary learning opportunities, formative assessment, timely responsiveness to student emails. I try to respond to my students' emails within 24 hours um, or refer them to external supports for issues that you're not equipped to handle, such as mental illness or financial difficulties or health conditions or safety issues. Um, and when you're referring them to those external supports, if you're on campus, if it's you know a face-to-face -face class, walking them over to that building and introducing them there is really going to uh, make it more likely that they'll seek out that support and that they'll take advantage of that um, if that's a feasible thing for you to do. Um, and then speaking of office hours, try to remove barriers to students meeting with you by offering you know, times and formats and structures for meetings. So for example, um, different times of the day, options for virtual meetings or face-to-face -face meetings or phone or text or email. Um, and then also giving them the option to either meet individually or in groups. So imagine that you are asked to be a part of a grant writing team and they only give you a vague idea about the time commitment and what a successful proposal would look like. So that'd probably be pretty stressful. Similarly, if you have a lack of clear expectations in your course, your students are gonna be stressed out. So what is the structure of your due dates? What does success look like in your class? How is the course organized? Hi, Matt. Um, and what will the workload look like from week to week? So a few ways to make sure that your expectations are clear to students from the start of the course include um, including both semester goals and daily or weekly objectives in your syllabus um, or in a separate, separate document, if you prefer. Um, providing a schedule of deadlines for major assignments and exams and stick to those as much as possible so that students know what to expect, they can plan for that. Give, give clear instructions and requirements for every assignment so that students know what is, is being expected of them and what they need to do to be successful. Um, be transparent about how students will be graded. So for example, use a grading rubric, share it with students when they're assigned a task. Um, also align your exam questions with the daily or weekly objectives that you developed and shared in the syllabus. 
If any uh, questions don't align with the stated objectives, then don't include those questions. Make note of that misalignment and then consider revising your objectives for the next semester so that you can include those questions later if, if it's feasible to do so. Um, and then finally, just design your course content that's, so that students can find what they're looking for. Um, organize it around objectives or units or weekly schedules, for example, whatever makes the most sense, but as long as it's easy to navigate and it's intuitive for students and it's consistent. So another component to inclusivity and equity in teaching is developing a fair, consistent and clear grading structure. You may, may be an advocate of rigor in your classes, um, and that may lead to an assumption that your goal in grading is to weed out students who don't belong or can't hack it in the discipline. Um, some clues that this is a faculty member's grading style might be a syllabus statement stating what percentage of students will earn an A in the course, um, what percentage can expect to fail. It might involve ranking students or grading students relative to one another's performance rather than a set of predetermined criteria. So the message to students when faculty express this mindset is that we don't see each student as capable of success. And the goal is to sort students into who can succeed and those who can't. And that reinforces that fixed mindset that we're trying to work against as inclusive educators. It also feeds into students' insecurities and those feelings of imposter phenomenon, which is not conducive to learning and succeeding in any course. So for courses where this is the approach to grading, who is most likely to do well? Students who already do well in high stakes situations, students who have the time and the money for test prep training or study groups or who don't have outside work or caregiving responsibilities. So in other words, students who already feel like they belong. This kind of grading practice communicates exclusion to our students, not inclusion. It also works against creating a sense of community in our courses because students are competing for those spots at the top. They don't have confidence that they'll get one of those tough spots um, and they may feel discouraged from even doing well in the course and they might just withdraw either officially or unofficially by disappearing from the course. So we don't want to create unnecessary obstacles to our student success. We want to provide clear, fair grading guidelines, make sure that students know what mastery or success in our course um, and on individual assessments looks like and then give them a path to succeed. Another way to practice inclusivity and equity in our courses um, is to ensure that we align our content with what students care about or are interested in. Um, obviously without um, compromising the actual essential course content, but we can ensure that we're aligning it with, with what students care about or making students care about it. So consider the course material and the diversity of students in your class. When you find out more about your students, you can develop content and readings and skills that might be engaging to them. Put yourself in your students' shoes. Ask, why should students care about this? Why should a student from a rural farming community care why I'm, what, about what I'm teaching in this math course? Why should a military veteran studying to become an accountant care what we're learning in this literature course? Also add diverse perspectives to your course content. Expand your reading list. Include different ethnic, racial, or other perspectives in a case study, for example. Um, make sure your PowerPoint presentations include diverse examples and images. Don't tokenize particular students or representations. Rather, help students imagine themselves within your learning scenarios specifically and the discipline more broadly. And then finally, you could use an interest survey to find out more about your students and their interests and backgrounds. Ask about their plans for the future, their work experience, what they're concerned about in the course, what they're interested in discovering, and so on. So a lot of us have learned or used the active learning technique of maybe think pair share or think write pair share. Um, but sometimes we forget about that thinking part and we expect students to start sharing with each other right away. And that thinking component is where the inclusivity piece comes in. It allows students the time to form their thoughts before they pair up or group up and then share those thoughts with one another. Some students come up with things to say relatively quickly. For others, it might take more time to organize and articulate those thoughts. So giving all of our students time to think and write down some ideas before 
pair it up and have them share is, is a really important step in that process. It helps us avoid um, the quick thinking students monopolizing the discussion while others feel maybe overwhelmed um, or intimidated or left behind. And it might also help us avoid students just blindly accepting their peers' ideas before they really had a chance to consider what they think. And then finally, it reinforces this idea that everyone's contributions contributions are valuable and they're worth waiting for. There's some discomfort in the silence of the thinking part. We tend not to like that silence. We try to fill it, but we should resist that temptation. Try to embrace the silence so that students learn that thinking takes time and so that they get comfortable taking their time to think about what they've heard. You could also use a timer to control the silence so that you don't give in to the urge to cut it short. Some faculty may consider structure as handholding, but we want to try to resist that impulse to dismiss structure. Without structure, our course goals may be accomplished or they may not. More structure works for most students and it doesn't hurt those who don't need it. So um, less structure doesn't affect students who don't need the structure, but it does limit the learning of those who need that structure. So if we want to be inclusive educators, we need to learn, lean into that approach that's going to serve the most students, and that is more structure. Um, students have different backgrounds, different personalities, social supports, learning differences, confidence levels. So adding that structure to our courses helps us to reach more students. Um, no structure teaching methods include things like lecturing and cold calling. Um, they're sometimes used to identify quote unquote weak students. And those students wind up left behind and they're excluded from the learning experience. Discomfort with learning is a distraction from learning. So if a, a student has anxiety, for example, about being called out in front of the entire class, that discomfort is gonna distract the student from their learning experience. Another practice of low structure courses is prioritizing high stakes assessments without providing opportunities to practice and receive feedback. So we want to incorporate more low stakes formative assessments with helpful feedback to benefit all of our students and to prepare them for those higher stakes assessments. Um, and in, in addition to building structure into the course design, we can also build that same structure into our assignments. So we want to make sure that our assignments clearly convey our expectations, um, including the parameters, the media, the genre, the purpose, the audience for that assessment. Um, so just ask, what, what are the criteria for sex, success on this particular assignment? If more structure is built into the assignment and expectations are clear, then students are more likely to succeed. They're less likely to think of that assignment as, you know, trying to just read your mind as the instructor. Um, and if, if your classes are anything like mine, it can be like pulling teeth to get students to speak up in a whole class discussion. Small groups are a lower pressure way for students to share their ideas, and I found that they work really well in my own classes. Students who are, you know, staring at their desks or staring down when I ask a question or trying to avoid, <laughs> trying to avoid eye contact um, when I ask a question of the whole class, you know, turn into more animatedly expressing their perspectives with just two or three of their classmates in a small group. And then while students are sharing in their small groups, I walk around and listen in on what the groups are saying, make sure that they're staying on task, and then chime in to encourage their ideas. Um, one thing that might help with the structure of small groups is to establish some rules. Um, and you can do that with the uh, participation of students. So, you know, have them develop those rules so they have some more ownership over them. Um, for example, students need to exchange names before they begin sharing ideas, or they need to put away their cell phones or laptops, or they need to take notes on what each other says. Also, um, students should have really clear instructions for what they're supposed to be discussing. So have that on a handout or up on the projector screen, um, provide the information in multiple ways, ideally. Um, so we don't just wanna give oral direction, something written as well that they can refer to. Um, and that'll ensure inclusion for students with auditory disabilities or learning disabilities or language barriers um, or you know neurodiversity. And then finally include some accountability measures for small group work and discussions to make sure that students are actually accomplishing what they need to accomplish. Um, so for example, they could submit a shared document or a worksheet 
or turn in notes that they took on what their group member said, or they could, you know, appoint a group member to report out um, to the rest of the class on the group's conversation. Um, also consider including participation in your course that allows for anonymity, and that'll help students with, you know, anxiety um, or shyness or insecurity or minority opinions to feel more comfortable sharing their ideas and viewpoints. So for instance, maybe a student with a conservative viewpoint may not feel comfortable participating in class discussion if they feel like everyone else in the class agrees with a liberal viewpoint. A couple of ways to use anonymous inclusion um, include having students submit anonymous responses on a note card or a sheet of paper or um, and then have them you know swap those a few times so that we don't know who is who's um, and then students can read those viewpoints aloud without knowing who's is who's so they're reading somebody else's viewpoint aloud um, you can also use um, technology to do this so you can use anonymous surveys online or classroom response systems like clickers or web polls or you can use an online discussion board with the option to remain anonymous so there are lots of different options for um, including this anonymity for inclusion. Um, also, evaluate learning throughout your class. Don't talk through the entire class period. How are we going to determine if students are learning if all they're doing is listening to us speak? So we want to evaluate whether students are learning and provide opportunity for students to demonstrate their learning in real time. Um, and that's an important way to make sure that students are progressing toward our learning outcomes. Just covering the content doesn't mean students are learning the content. So again, just covering the content does not mean that students are learning the content. One way to assess student learning would be low stakes quizzes or formative assessments. Um, that'll allow you to obtain evidence about the learning of all of your students and identify when you know even a small number of students are not learning. So you can change your approach um, or offer you know, a supplemental approach to those students. You could also include typical test questions in your classes. So if you, uh, you know, teach a uh, class that has you know, major tests, you know, include some, some of those typical test questions in your actual classes, and that'll help students see the caliber and the types of questions that they could expect on the, the major assessment. And it also gives you a chance to assess students' mastery of course concepts before they take that high stakes exam. Um, if students need extra support, either as a whole or individually, you can then identify that and provide them with those supports before it's too late. You can also assess students before and after class, so it's not just something that you can do during class. Um, so for example, you could give students a vocab quiz to take before class to see whether they understand the terminology that you'll use during that class's uh, lesson or you can assign a formative assessment asking them to apply what they learned from the lesson after class for homework. Pre and post class assessments help students build effective study habits too. Um, an important rule for those assessments is that they should be required so that you have more information about students learning and so that students have a more realistic idea of their own learning as well. Um, having a single exam or a paper that carries a ton of weight in a student's course grade risks letting that one experience destroy a student's grade and also creates unnecessary stress. A more inclusive approach might be to downplay high stakes work by offering alternatives, um, such as allowing them to drop a quiz grade or letting them retake an exam or replacing some of the weight of major, of major assessments with multiple smaller assessments that maybe build up to that major assessment. So ask yourself whether your grading scheme is allowing students to learn and grow or whether it's unintentionally sabotaging their learning and making them feel like they don't belong or just can't succeed. Um, so this strategy might be easiest to implement. Um, we always learn something when we survey our own students. So um, at the beginning of the semester, you can ask students what makes them feel included in a course. Uh, check in again at mid-semester to find out what students think could be improved so you can make some meaningful changes for the second half of the course. And then at the end of the semester, you can also survey students to ask them in what ways did you convey that you cared for students learning. You can use anonymous surveys so that students feel comfortable being honest about their experiences um, and ways that they feel that the course could be improved and made more inclusive. 
So um, many faculty members still think that a challenging course should be like an obstacle race. You, you set up the tasks and each student has to finish them to a certain standard and within a set amount of time. And if only a few students can do it, that means the course is rigorous. So terms like rigor and grit and imposter phenomenon lay the credit or the blame on an individual, in this case, the student, when often it's the academic system that creates barriers to student success and makes students feel like they don't belong. So let's recognize rigor for the exclusionary idea that it is and for the privileged practices it usually promotes. For some faculty, abandoning rigor to them, it means lowering standards and watering down courses. Um, many options of and approaches to rigor involve privileging students who have high academic literacy or are already aware of the hidden curriculum of higher education, the unofficial rules, the routines, the procedures, the structures. Academic rigor doesn't help us build our students' academic literacy, and it doesn't help us reveal to them the hidden curriculum. But we can have both high standards and inclusive teaching practices. So first, we'll just stop using the term rigor, which is usually code for some students belong here and some don't. It's become an exclusionary term, and we want to be inclusive educators. Ultimately, we can maintain high standards for our courses while also providing all students with the support and tools they need to reach those standards. Um, some ways to to support student success include incorporating frequent low stakes assessments and activities to help students practice the concepts and skills required to meet your course's high standards, um, providing clear course expectations so that students know what is expected of them um, and what they need to do to be successful, move away from grading on a curve so that student, students earn um, the grade that they receive uh, rather than it being contingent upon what other people in the course earn uh, for their grade. And then also consider mastery-based grading um, or specifications grading. So grading based on their mastery of course concepts versus um, being graded on you know, uh, other things like small assignments, compliance, those types of things. Um, so we want to assume that all of our students are capable of success that they deserve to pursue the academic discipline that they choose. We don't wanna to try to weed out students. We wanna design our courses in a way that helps students master those essential concepts and skills. Um, we wanna set high standards and we wanna provide students with the support that they need to meet those standards. Um, so I mentioned towards the beginning of the workshop, the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Educators Toolkit. So I wanna show that to you. Okay, so I just wanted to show this to you um, that it's here and what kinds of things are on here. Um, but it's very helpful. It gives you some resources for navigating classroom dynamics. Um, inclusive statements for syllabi are here as well. You can just copy and paste. Um, it covers bias in the classroom, microaggression. Um, We've got a multilingual student statement, undocumented student information and statements, um, resources on culturally responsive teaching, and some other websites of interest, as well as an anti-racism reading list. So this is really um, just a wealth of information um, in this toolkit, um, particularly you know, something easy that you can do is just include these inclusive statements. Um, and the multilingual student statement and a statement on uh, supporting undocumented students, like those things just to indicate to your students, you belong here um, and this is a safe space for you to learn. All right, so um, any questions for me at this point? And I do have some resources that I'll share with you via email, um, including that that toolkit that I just showed you, as well as AQ's Inclusive Teaching Practices Toolkit, um, uh, How to Make Your Teaching More Inclusive Advice Guide by VG Sathy and Kelly Hogan, um, who actually spoke for us um, this past spring, and Inclusive Teaching Strategies from um, Yale's Center for Teaching and Learning, as well as um, an article on, on the word rigor 
by Jordan Jack and Miyu Safi. All right, well, thank you so much for joining me today to talk about demonstrating inclusivity and equity in your course.